So welcome everyone to another webinar for residential design professionals. Uh, today we have Andy Rail with uh, SIPS, structurally in structure, structural insulated panels. It would be good if I knew what I was talking about. Um, hence the reason we're having the uh, webinar. Um, it, I'm going to ask that as we go, you put your questions in the chat box and we will go through those at the end and uh and we're going to get started so right now um i'm here to introduce andy rail with structural insulated panels andy go ahead and take it away all right well, thank you dennis for uh inviting me to um this installment um my name is andy rail um, I'm with, I'm a principal and founder of Moonlight Architecture located in Cincinnati, uh, well, in Lebanon, Ohio, which is between Cincinnati and, and Columbus. Um, I'm here as a, uh, member of the Structural Insulated Panel Association, um, sit on the board of, of directors for that association and have for the last, um, I'm in my first year with that, but I've been with the association since uh, 2018 as a design professional. Um, got a little bit more information on that, but uh, thank you for joining in on the uh, structural insulated panel uh, residential design with SIPS. Um, this is a accredited AIA um, CEU for one hour of HSW. Um, when I get to a screen, there will be a QR code that you'd be able to, to scan with your phone. And there's, uh, we'll throw in the chat at the end of the session, the um, a link you can click on to fill out your information, your email your address and everything, uh, your AIA number, if you want us to, to actually issue credits to your transcript um, for you to, to gather that information. Um, so we'll do that towards the end of the show. Um, so this is uh, going to be like a one-on-one course. Um, so it's going to be a very um, a broad discussion on SIPs. Um, let's see if I can. For some reason, my I don't know why I'm at the end. Yeah, bear with me one moment. There we go. We're at the end. Just happens to be the same slide on both of those. So, um, all right, there we go. So here's the uh, AIA Continuing Ed Program accredited, um, the boilerplate session to show that we are accredited with the AIA. Um, here's the QR code. If you have a smartphone uh, with your screen, you can uh, scan that QR code, fill out your information, and we'll get you your your certificate at the end of the, um, at the end of the session. Uh, again, it's one hour health, safety, and welfare course. Um, you know, more AI stuff. Uh, oh, that's there. So again, I'm Andy Rail. I'm um, founding principal for Moonlight Architecture. Uh, I am an uh, NCARB cert certificate holder, uh, licensed in 32 states. Uh, primarily focusing on high performance residential uh, using structural insulated panels as the main component. My first SIP project was in 20 or 2011, and I have made the decision to go exclusively with SIPs in 2017 um, after some, you know, bunch of research and, and whatnot and, and just seeing what the product can do um, made that commitment. Uh, I'm again board of directors on SIPA. I'm also a SIPA registered master builder and master SIP designer. Uh, we have a SIP school in West Virginia where you can do hands on training um, to actually physically put a SIP project together, which is a, a two day session, but it's a, a great introductory to that as well as getting into the nuts and bolts of it. Um, in addition to AIA, I'm also you know a member of all these other associations, mainly uh, high performance um, components like EBA and Zero Energy Ready Home Program and, and Energy Star and, and whatnot. Uh, in this course, you will explain the benefits of designing with structural insulated panels or SIPs for residential applications. 
Uh, we have a separate course for commercial applications, um, but that's kind of a, a little bit of a different animal. So we won't be going into too much uh, commercial aspect of it, although I'd be happy to answer any questions at the end of the, uh, the session regarding that. Um, design professional, uh, you guys will, will gain a better understanding of the application assembly and detailing in order to properly utilize SIPs for optima, optimum energy efficiency and durability. And through case studies and design strategies, you'll have a better understanding designing with current industry standards with SIPs. Uh, learning objecti objectives include, um, you know, you should be able to, we hope that you would be able to describe and define SIPs in their residential applications, explain energy efficiency design strategies utilizing SIPs, illustrate some SIP design and engineering methods, and list and describe current industry assembly standards. Um, we'll outline SIP basics, SIP applications, energy efficiency and green building with SIPs, designing with SIPs, engineering, SIP manufacturing, and SIP construction. I know that seems like a lot of, uh, lot of components, but really they all kind of work together. Uh, once you get a really understanding of how SIPs work, all this, all these other components will will start making sense. Uh, so the first question is, what is a SIP? Well, a SIP is a structurally insulated panel. Uh, it's a composite structural panel that consists of uh, two skins on the interior and the exterior, which typically is OSB, um, and then with a rigid foam core, which is either EPS slash GPS, which is a graphite infused. Uh, polystyrene, um, XPS, which is rigid, or polyurethane. Um, those OSB facings are usually 7 16 inch. Um, they can range uh, from a you know, quarter inch to three quarters of an inch thick. Um, 7 16 is a kind of what the industry standard, probably 85 to 90% of SIPs um, that are utilized in the country are, are with OSB. And then they're all adhered together with a structural adhesive. Um, I like to call it Gorilla Glue on steroids. It's just a very, very, um, you know, high, high strength adhesive, you know, bonding everything together. Um, here's a cross section of it. So you've got, um, you know, the two skins with the rigid foam insulation. They're held together with a, a spline. Uh, glued together with the adhesive and include an electrical chase <clears throat> built in with by the manufacturer to easily install electrical wiring within the panel itself. Um, some places use those chases to run plumbing, although I don't recommend installing plumbing in, in an exterior wall. We wouldn't do that if, anyway, so using it in a SIP isn't a common application anyway. Uh, the background, uh, it was developed as stressed skin panels in the 1930s. Um, actually, Frank Lloyd Wright's son was the first one who actually is credited inventing the panels. Um, they started becoming more modern in the night in 1969 using foam core and, you know, and foams for the core. Um, SIPs were created to help minimize uh, framing by using the panel faces as the carrying loads. Um, a SIP is a true structural panel, and it's a, a load carrying panel. Um, it replaces a traditional wall, uh, has a better R value over the entire wall surface because it's uh, a continuous insulation uh, for a higher whole wall R value. And with the SIPs, uh, with the OSB skins, uh, the load bearing component element, um, we find it to be the equivalent of using two by 10 studs at 16 on center when it comes to structural bearing capacities. Um, so the OSB is your structural component of that, with the two skins together <clears throat> and the cap on the top, it becomes one structural component together. Uh, it wouldn't be able to function without the entire component. So it's, uh, you know, you take off a skin and it's not not going to be able to carry it. It needs that entire component to um, come up with its structural properties. Uh, certain types of, of SIPs, um, you know, some, I'm sure a lot of you have seen the insulated metal wall panels. These are not structural load-bearing SIPs, um, so they're not really SIPs. They're just uh, 
insulated metal panels. Um, those skins aren't in a, they don't have the structural capacity or the properties to be able to be a load bearing component. Uh, there are other types of SIPs other than OSB. Um, there's cementitious skins. Um, then we also have MGO skins, which are pretty common. Uh, the downfall with those is they're extremely heavy. Um, the nice thing about the OSB skins is you are able to have what we call jumbo panels made, which are eight foot panels by 24 foot panels. Uh, whereas with the cement or MGL, you're you're kind of limited to four foot by a maximum of 10 foot panels. Um, so using the, the OSB gives you a lot more capability to utilize more of a panel and, and smaller, you know, and bigger components, so less components when uh, installing in a project. Uh, so why do you use SIPs? Well, it's to it's a simple energy efficient insulating framing system. So instead of having studs and uh, sheathing and all that that have to be layered together, uh, you have all those components in one piece uh, delivered and installed on site at one time. Uh, they exceed code requirements uh, while delivering more comfortable, durable buildings, minimizing time, money, and labor. Uh, we have seen a lot of home projects be installed in a matter of, of hours and days as opposed to weeks or sometimes months, depending on how big your project is. Uh, it also reduces the amount of on-site um, trash. Um, you know, all these panels are are delivered to the site pre-cut already, um, you know, optimized for your project. So you unload it off the truck and you install it on site uh, with very little, very little waste on site to have to worry about. Uh, the last project I installed was for my parents. That was, uh, we had a 30 yard dumpster for the entire project and we only filled half of it. So uh, I know a lot of these places, you know, I've seen job sites where you have to unload a, a dumpster two or three times a week sometimes. And we just, we don't have that um, aspect when it comes to building with SIPs. And also future proofs a legacy and to meet more demanding upcoming standards with third party verified and engineered sustainable solutions. Uh, as we all know, um, you know, there's a, a, a race to reducing carbon in our world. And by doing this, um, SIPS is just one, uh, one component that can really reduce the amount of not only carbon uh, within the material itself, but the amount of energy used throughout the, the life of the home. Um, SIPA is a um, association here to support manufacturers and, and dealers and designers uh, with all kinds of information and training. Um, this, we have a SIP specification that's downloadable from the website. Um, it's, written for every manufacturer who's a member of SIPA. Uh, the benefit of having a SIPA manufacturer for a project is they are required to go through rigorous testing, uh, periodic code testing, um, have to upkeep their code reports. Um, they'll get surprise visits from tests to do, uh, you know, compression tests on site based on what they're doing. And if they uh, pass it, then, you know, it's kind of like a spot check. Uh, for quality assurance. Um, not all, if you're not a member of SIPA, you're not required by the association and there's really no no other policing of that other than the association when it comes to using SIPs. Um, we also have a whole slew of kind of basic connection details on our website. Um, basically every different component with Every uh, condition that we can think of, there's been some kind of general information provided for that. Uh, if there's anything that's really specific that doesn't really, that the basic doesn't fit into your your design, then uh, you know we're here to help through an engineering process to help uh, develop a detail that works for your project. Uh, some typical SIP, uh, you know, with the connections for, for a typical SIP connection is uh, what we call surface splines. 
and what it is is it's just routed out at the panel inner at the panel joints um and then these splines are glued and nailed into the panel and then we run a continuous speed of, of sealant in between the panels which is uh, emphasized by the little red mark here the benefit of doing that is you have a continuous um you know insulation throughout the entire wall system and this is in plan view uh, just in case you weren't familiar with that uh, the also benefit of having that sealant there is to prevent air infiltration coming through this this joint so it's got to go through the spline the sealant the spline to in order to get from one side to the next and with a well connected uh, joint that just doesn't it doesn't happen uh, some manufacturers then what we have um, what they call as block splines um, so what they do is relieve they relieve the panel the foam out of the panel and then have basically a mini sip that's glued and nailed within that joint and uh, so by doing that it, it, it still creates that continuous insulation barrier through through the entire width of um, thickness of the wall In some cases, we got to do a lumber spline. And when this would happen is if there's a structural component that um, needs a little bit more structural capacity to it. Um, typically, these type of connections are at uh, beam pockets or if there's a truss girder or something like that that's coming in at that point. Um, the, the SIP itself has some bearing capabilities, but uh, point load. Um, you know, when it gets pretty heavy, then it gets a little bit too much for the panel. You can achieve it by making a, a wider panel, but uh, we're trying to utilize the panel to its most efficiency. Um, adding a couple of pieces of lumber in there doesn't really hurt it much as long as you get your sealant joints in there. Um, the biggest energy hog on a wall component is really more air infiltration than it is for thermal bridging. So even though this kind of creates a thermal bridge here, um, it really doesn't reduce the overall R value or performance of the wall itself. Uh, intersections, um, we've got a lumber spline at the, basically at the end of each panel that's in the relief foam. And then they're attached at the intersecting points with a SIP screw that you know, usually about 24 inches on center depending on what the structural requirements are, uh, seismic and, and wind and things like that. Um, again, with the continuous um, sealant at all the joints to help prevent air infiltration. Uh, SIP details at the walls for openings. Um, the nice thing about the jumbo panels, the eight foot panels is you can actually cut out uh, smaller openings in there without the requirement of any kind of headers or frame around the windows. Um, you could actually just cut into the panel and, and put your wood bucks in there to anchor your windows in. Um, so you don't have a big, you know, a big header over crossed and bearing studs to, to carry that. Um, so the SIP itself can function as the header in most cases. Uh, at least on smaller openings and, and doors. Uh, when you get thinner panel, you know, thinner walls at the top, I think you probably don't want to get any less than one foot over the top of that with a wall panel. And again, it, it's dependent on your load uh, that it's carrying above it. Uh, when you do have to have some bigger panels or bigger openings, um, you can still use a SIP as a header panel. Um, and we just need to add some additional lumber at the, those points in order to to frame that out and and stiffen that opening. Um, so the manufacturer takes your plans and they'll determine what kind of structures needed for those openings. And as part of the shop drawing process, we'll basically engineer those out for you and propose those structural components for you. At the floorings, um, one area of big energy loss is that at your rim joists. Uh, when you do a platform framing, you know how do you really seal that off? Um, you know, some places they they want to they spray foam that or they stuff it with 
with uh, bad insulation or something to try to seal that off. Um, our typical detail is to actually bring the panel down to the root to the foundation and actually set the floor structure on the inside face of that. And what that does is that continues that um, foam that uh, continuous insulation down to the top of your your foundation wall. Um, I like to use superior walls or ICFs as my foundation, so that can that basically continues that. Uh, our value, you know, that through insulation down to your footing makes a nice, clean, continuous seal for that. Uh, at second floor walls, uh, we usually do a top core or a top hung um, hangers, or you could do top hung joists set on top of the wall. Um, the way that this detail works is you've got the relief into the foam, and then you've got a ripped. A two by cap plate, which is basically the replacement of your double top plate. Um, so by having that piece there, it carries your load continuous on both of the um, skins to give you your continuous structure. And then you write your floor sheathing over top of it. There's some details where you could have this run through and have a uh, just a ledger board here that's screwed fast to that. Um, some issues with that is you don't get quite the diaphragm structure with your floor sheathing. Uh, doing this detail, you've, you've got basically, a, you could, you know, got a tank of a structure completed for that detail. And then you just continue on from there with your second floor. Um, roof conditions where you have a SIP roof on top of a foam or on top of a SIP wall. Uh, the manufacturer bevels off the top piece of the the foam at the at the same pitch as as your roof so you again you get that nice continuous seat on there and then uh you know screw your roof panel directly to the top of that your ridge detail um one condition is typically obviously you need to have some kind of structure to carry your the edge of your roof panels at the ridge so using a ridge beam is pretty typical. Um, nice thing about that too is you can get that foamed in there to have a continuous uh, insulation over the top of your ridge. Um, we've had some testing to where uh, a ridge vent is recommended uh, to allow for any kind of moisture that's within the panel. Uh, you, the important part of having a uh, a sip is the ability for it to dry out uh, by putting, you know, having your air barrier on the one side or your water barrier on the other side. Um, you want whatever moisture you have in there, a pathway to be able to dry out. Um, and in most cases, you want it to vent out through the top. So having that ridge vent allows for any moisture that might be in that panel to vent out through that continuous ridge vent. It's a little bit of a different situation uh, you don't have the low and high draw of the air it's just there for uh, a pathway for anything to to work its way out um, there's some other eave details uh, this is one eave detail uh, with the gutter board um, if you don't like the big honking big panel of a roof you can stop it right at the wall and and frame in a, a typical you know, bird's mouth type um, soft fit there to, to give it more of a traditional look. Um, again, there's no, no reason that this is considered a hot roof. So there's no, no real reason for any kind of ventilation required for your roofing. Um, this detail is showing shingle roofs. Um, I like to use metal roof because it has its own basically built in, uh, air screen, you know, air barrier behind it or air, uh, gap behind it to allow anything between the roofing and the panel to be able to naturally vent out by itself as part of its uh, components. Uh, some places want to have that vent to make it into a cool roof. You know, um, so what we would do is is basically put a furring strips and then another layer of, of sheathing with the shingles on top of that. Um, haven't really seen that installed in the field. Um, in theory, they say it works, but 
<clears throat> this is just uh, another process of doing that. If you really wanted to have shingles and you really wanted that ven ventilated shingle, back shingle for that, this would be the detail that you would do for that. Uh, the fasteners, the SIP screws, um, they range anywhere from six inches to 16 inches. Um, they have different ones based on what you're attaching to. Um, this first one is is just a screw into wood. The second one is for light gauge. And then the second one, third one is for uh, heavy duty and a steel, which can be used to attach to up to 3 sixteenths of an inch thick um, red steel red iron for that so there, there's no need to pre-drill um, these these uh, screws are specifically designed even at 16 inches uh, with the torque capacity to be able to to drill into those those pieces without any issue uh, sealing at the joints um, a lot of manufacturers use the two pack or the two-part froth pack uh, these you would want to foam in around windows and doors and at the joints of your splines. Um, some other ones have, um, you know, just the single foam. But basically, the, the biggest thing that you want to try to do is close off any air gaps. Um, the panels themselves will give you the broad, uh, you know, resistance to any air infiltration. But it also, um, you know, you, you do have some gaps that are achieved through you know just by installation and so that this is a, a way to to seal those gaps off and and make it a continuous envelope uh sip insulation is just better um the oak ridge national laboratory studied had done a comparison between a sip wall with a typical stud wall uh, our values is only half of half of the battle when it comes to performance um so that's the thermal transmittance, but again, the air infiltration is is really a big piece of that. That these uh, R values just don't don't accommodate for or don't account for in their in their listings. So a four and a half inch SIP wall outperforms a two by six stud wall with R nineteen. So with a two by six wall uh, R nineteen, uh, you're, you, you've got an overall performance of R13.7 because of the thermal bridging that happens at the stud joints. Um, you've got a framing factor of about 25% um, being solid wood on a framed wall. Whereas with a SIP, it's you know 5%, 5 to 7% with the, the joints and the, you know, around the windows and at the intersection, you know, at the corners and things like that. Um, a two, a six inch six and a half inch sip wall which is typical um is almost 100 times better than a two by six with r19 when it comes to the r value comparison and again this is from the oak ridge national laboratory studies uh, the thermal bridging is always a, a conversation so the one on the left is uh, with a wood framed again these aren't with any kind of continuous rigid on the outside um, this is just uh, like a two by six uh, stud wall with bad insulation, which is code minimum in most cases. Um, actually, doesn't e even meet code minimum in a lot of cases anymore. But um, in comparison, the sips on the side, this would be uh, this is what you would see with a four and a half inch wall, which would be the equivalent, or it will would actually exceed the performance of this wall at a smaller profile and really is a probably a lesser cost initially for the those two components when you do cost of material and labor and time on the site constructing um so you just see there there's some little bit of of bridging uh, but nothing that really would affect the indoor environment of the space uh, maybe, you know, some of you may have seen things like this. This is what uh, a Wolfie study would show, um, you know, with a SIP, with a surface spline, you can kind of see it within the panel itself. It's a very consistent hot, cold um, temperature within that, whereas a stud wall, you, you have these ins and outs because of these framing, the framing factor. 
and there's the uh yeah optimized framing is 16 percent stick to conventional stick is 20 about 25 percent and sips are between six and eight and a half percent of uh lumber within the wall itself Uh, air tightness sips can make homes tight enough to meet passive house air tightness standard um as we know that's one of the the toughest standards to achieve um which is 0.6 air changes per hour um if most sip houses that i've worked in uh they've all been less than one air change per hour um which is just and that's just with the typical installation that's not really going into very much you know attention to detail or anything like that so they just there aren't the gaps to have that air infiltration because of the the large surface panels that just don't have those opportunities to to pass through uh, more than 40 percent of a home's total envelope loss is due to air infiltration so by eliminating all that you can increase the the uh, performance of your envelope by more than 40 percent uh, SIPs are recognized by Energy Star as a method to reduce the thermal bridging. Um, passive House is also include SIPs in their prescriptive path. Um, they've actually achieved it to where if you build a house out of SIPs, you um, they actually eliminate the requirement of a blower door test because they know by just by experience that that is going to achieve that that level uh, pretty easily. <clears throat> I don't necessarily recommend bypassing that because the blower door test is a quality control measure that um, um, that you want to have in, in your install. Uh, I actually recommend having two blower door tests done, one at the uh, before drywall and then one at the completion. So the one at before drywall, so if you have any air gaps that are coming through, you have an opportunity to be able to fill those before you cover it up with with your finish. And then at the final one, that's that's your uh, third party testing for your incentives and certifications. The HERS index is a scoring system established by ResNet. Um, how's, it references the home built house in 2006 and has a HERS index of 100. Um, so if, if you've never seen one of these indexes before, it, it's kind of like, um, you know, that MPG of your of your car only you know it's backwards <laughs> so the lower the number the better so it's like you know a golf score i guess um a typical house uh a typical sip house we've seen uh hers indexes around 30 to 35. Uh, it's about as low as you can get before you can before you have to start introducing um, energy production on your home so like solar panels or or wind or or things like that, um, but so thirty to thirty five is is an excellent home. Most of mine are in the low forties. Um, it just seems to be where it lands. Uh, a standard new home is is at one hundred. Um, uh, the SIP R value again. These are these are based on what we are told that they have to used to compare with other com uh, with other uh, materials. So these are our values at the mean temperature at 75 degrees. Um, we know that the foam as it gets colder actually performs better. You know, so the R values actually uh, don't drop. They actually increase as the temperature goes down. Um, so, you know, 14.4 for a four and a half inch EPS is uh, you know the the minimum the six and a half inch that's typical of what we use um, throughout the industry you know through uh, basically a six and a half inch wall and a ten and a half inch roof will will uh, exceed the energy codes in pretty much every part of the country except for the very extreme cold weather where we have to do a 12 and a quarter inch roof um, in those cases Um, SIPs can help you achieve the highest level in all the green building programs, such as LEED for Homes, NAHB Green Building Program, Earthcraft Passive, and other state uh, green building programs. Uh, they cut down on job site waste that I described earlier. Low HERS Index helps you achieve more points in most of those green building programs and resource efficiency for engineered wood products. 
uh, lead for homes. They're, uh, these are all the, the points that are on the table when it comes to using SIPs. So you can see really just uh, for annual energy use, using SIPs can, can really gain you a lot of those points. Uh, air infiltration, I'm kind of surprised. Maybe there aren't that many points um, available for that, but you can get points for each of those. Uh, it's an environmentally preferred product uh, for FCC or FSC certified OSB and 100 mile radius. Um, and that that's fairly easy to achieve. Uh, there are a couple OSB plants that make the SIP skins. Uh, there's one in the south, there's one in the northeast. Uh, so the east is is covered when it comes to the 500 mile radius for sure. Uh, but the 100 mile radius might be an option as well, opportunity for site specific projects. Uh, lifestyle, uh, life cycle assessments and foam, e foam EPDs. Um, we've actually just received our EPD for SIPs as an industry last week. It's in the process of getting recorded and, and published. Uh, but the average en energy savings over 50 years is 9.9 .9 times the energy invested in using SIPs compared to traditional stick framing uh, construction in American homes. So over the course of 50 years, you're drastically reducing the amount of energy uh, needed for that those 50 years uh, provides reduction in global warming potential by 13.2 times equivalent to the co2 emissions produced uh, energy payback period is 5.1 years um, that's on average the cold weather climates actually will be quicker because uh, you're using less heating and cooling during those seasons um, and even in the hot areas I can see that payback coming back pretty quick too, because uh, not only keeping the uh, cold out, it also keeps the coolness in during you know cooling seasons and the and the more hot climates. Um, recapture of greenhouse gas emissions in three point eight years. Uh, SIPs in the code. Uh, the SIPs were originally introduced in the building code in two thousand nine as a prescriptive. Um, uh, this is the res this is the energy code, so uh, it's easily complies with 2009, 12, 15, 18, 21. Well, those are the IRC and then the IECC. Um, when it comes to your energy, um, we typically don't do the prescriptive requirements for um, the IECC for for those R values. Um, we know that they, you know, if it calls for an R21. Or let's just say an R49 roof. Um, we know that a, a panel that's less than uh, an R49 will will pass the energy code pretty substantially when you do the uh, UA alternative method using risk check or having a performance hers rating for that. Uh, I always recommend doing the performance method. Um, the benefit of doing that is you are now opening up incentives available to you through federal and state and local or um, incentives and, and grants and programs that are available for those like zero energy home ready programs and, and energy star and, and programs like that. Uh, SIPs are, can be uh, fire, hurricane, seismic and uh, structural compliance through code reports and standards. Uh, all of these panels go through uh, IECC ES evaluation testing. Um, we've done the hurricane test where you shoot the two by four into the wall. And in this case, the two by four just bounces right off. Um, so we know that, uh, you know, durability wise, it exceeds um, all standards when it comes to um, structural standards and code reports. Uh, SIP roof and wall compliance of the 2018 and 2021 IRC. Um, again, these are prescriptive in the building codes. Uh, we know the minimum thicknesses are easily achieved uh, even in the 2021 IECC. Um, same with the roof when it comes to commercial. Um, this will probably be the little, only a little bit of commercial part of that, uh, but SIPs easily meet all of those requirements for the IECC on the commercial level through 2021. And we've started reading through some of the um, 
proposed 2024 amendments and um we're we're still looking really good for, you know as a, a standard on our industry to exceed those on a regular basis sip applications um there's really no limit as to what sips can do um sips walls and roof is where you're going to get your best your overall best uh envelope performance however yeah, maybe you've got a, a roof that's a little bit complicated. Um, if you can do sips for the walls, then do sips for the walls, and and then just do this the roof with the uh, you know an energy heel and um, you know getting your your um, insulation envelope that way. Um, you can mix it in with truss roofs, um, timber frame, ICFs. Uh, you can do hybrids construction of any kind. Um, Anywhere you can use it where it makes sense, use it where it makes sense. And if it doesn't make sense, then yeah, let's talk. We'll find out why it doesn't make sense and and see if it really isn't a really isn't a an option for your project. It's affordable, effective renovation applications. Um, there's uh, you can actually get from these manufacturers an uh, insulated nail base <clears throat> to plaid the envelope of your house. Um, this project here uh, is in Marion, Ohio. I think when they were completed, they had a HERS rating of 42 with the the nail base, which is is pretty good for a for a retrofit. So renovations are an op opportunity to introduce them in as well. Uh, affordable, sustainable cost cost effective living houses, um, South Chicago workforce housing. So this is a very simple design um very cost effective because they used very simple basic spans um along with the cost of the construction their energy bills were drastically reduced uh, which gives them a monthly monthly bill uh, a mortgage plus uh, electric bill to be much better than a, a typical code minimum house where you know they have higher energy bills and really uh you know a higher mortgage um, the nice thing with SIPs too, you have opportunities to, um, there's some mortgage companies that'll actually give you a break on your mortgage rate because of, um, you know, SIPs are just perform, they perform better and they're just a better quality construction and uh, appraisers and mortgage companies are finally getting on board with that. Uh, affordable disaster resistant lead certified housing. Uh, this was down in New Orleans after the Hurricane Katrina. Um, so the Make It Right program uh, used SIPs down there for their, their projects. Um, modern sustainable designs. Um, yeah, a lot of the modern overhangs, you can overhang a SIP easily without any additional structure, about four feet. <clears throat> but when you get into bigger, longer spans like this can cantilever here then then introducing a roof panel or you know a roof structure will probably have to come in into play to help with those spans uh, but structurally they can create these type of designs and feels um, just with its own component uh, timber frames have been using sips for a long time to clad their their frame their timber uh, it makes a good structural um, tie together um, the SIPs will be able to provide the timber with its lateral and stability and, and shear properties that's needed that uh, using a typical two by exterior wall where you have to add cross bracing and things like that to tie the frame together. Uh, the SIPs are able to provide that lateral shear um, as part of its component as well as giving it a, its uh, energy efficient envelope. Uh, energy possibilities, there's really no limitation as to what it can do. Um, SIPs can give you <clears throat> a very structural wall without having to add a bunch of additional components to it. Um, I know on a timber frame project I did, we had to add steel into the project in order to create these big window openings. Um, SIPs are able to be able to design in their components to be able to to replace some of those steel. I'm not going to say it's going to eliminate it at all, but it definitely makes the structure component much easier. Um, and this project on the right, 
they actually uh, did a radius sip to make these roof barrel vault roof is, roof panels. Um, so the fa factories are are able to make some custom shapes on on a specific as needed basis. Um, you know, here's a craftsman design uh, from the street. You wouldn't even know it was a sip house. Um, so there's really not much to it that uh, um, you know. It, a sip house doesn't have to look unusual to anybody. It can look like any other house that you would traditionally see on the street. Um, a passive house here on the right. Um, roof design, um, you get some longer spans using the roof panels. Uh, in this case, we've got a ridge beam and what we call a purlin beam at the mid span. And what that does is it it, it does break up the the span up, but it creates two simple spans from ridge to eave. Uh, in a lot of cases, you'll be able to, I think on the next one, yeah, be able to do a continuous simple span ridge to eave um, without adding any additional component to it. Uh, longer spans, we have ways of getting that by adding some TGI splines <clears throat> to help uh, strengthen that as well as not give it too much of a a bridge, uh, ridge, thermal bridging, um, but also a very simple, easy connection for them to install in the field. Uh, air sealing and header-free windows. This just shows how you know this window here is just a cutout in the opening. They'll come in and buck frame that with two buys, and it's it's ready for window installation. Uh, you'll see here on uh, these panel joints, they've got a continuous B of sealant through here, as well as around. The, these are the wire chases that are factory in inserted um, from, from the factory, which is a continuous piece that goes around to be able to feed um, wiring through just like you would in a conduit, uh, just built in into the wall itself. Uh, complex designs are simplified. Um, so you can do some pretty complex components to it. Uh, the thing I like about this picture is you can see how clean the job site is. And, um, you know, they just, they, panels come on a skid, they set them there and they're ready to be installed all um, new numbered and tied to a shop drawing installed with, uh, you know, just like you would a Lego set. So I'll give you components of what's needed to be installed and, and how it needs to go together. Uh, sips.org is a great resource. Uh, we have a whole lot of online um, free stuff. <laughs> um, those who want to get CEUs, uh, we actually have seven and a half hours worth of continuing ed available there, all on demand um, through the SIP school. Al Cobb was the one who put those together. Um, that Those are our builders education for SIPs training, which is the best videos. Um, they can also be found on YouTube. Yeah. Uh, there's a SIPA Master Builder Program, SIP School, Hands-On Training. Uh, Joe, Dr. Joe here, uh, created what we call the um, Bible for SIP Design and Construction. Um, this is uh, it, this this one's not available for free, but it's available on our website for, I think, like 45 bucks. Uh, but it's, it's a great resource. It includes both just details of of uh, building science and you know builder side homeowner you know things for the homeowners to think of things for the uh, you know the architect as they're designing is all included in that um, there's some additional AIA and CBCI continuing ed courses on there um, there's a nice webinar or a nice presentation in there that Sam Rashkin presented for, um, it's called, uh, what, what do you call it? High performance enclosures, faster, better, more value when it comes to building with SIPs. Uh, he, he does lay out some great features on there to be able to think of, um, as well as um, things that you can, you know, arm yourself with uh, talking with homeowners and clients to, um, if they're interested in knowing what all the benefits are, uh, he's got a great presentation about what all the benefits are using SIPs. Um, case studies, need to know checklists, um, all those are on the website through SIPs.org and through the resource tab. Um, 
there's need to know resources. Uh, all these are free copies available on the website, free downloads, um, checklists. Uh, there's the best design practice series. So we get into basically every video is a specific topic. Um, so if there's something there that you don't, you know, like shop drawings, yeah, yeah, not really for you. That's for the builder to look at. A lot of these are are for the builder, but they're they're good for the designer as well. Um, but it does go into electrical and plumbing uh, specifications, uh, HVAC, uh, that's number two. That's actually a really important component to that, that I really didn't get too much into it. Um, the benefit of, of SIPs is air infiltration, which, you know, um, insulate right and vent or insulate tight, ventilate right as really a mindset to where using HVAC systems, you can ventilate, have a controlled ventilation, which includes increases drastically your indoor air quality uh, within your envelope. Here's the best program. So this is the 10 hours, uh, seven and a half hours of CEUs. Um, really great information um, taught by Al Cobb. I call him the SIP Yoda. He's, he's, he's my go-to for this stuff. Um, here's the website. Um, so when you click on it, I'll have the resources. Uh, you can even find experts. So if you have a project in a specific area, you can look on a map to be able to to find what who's available in your area. Um, me being licensed in 32 states, uh, one reason I'm I'm doing that is um, because SIPs are, even though they're prescriptive in the building code, most of my projects. And can't achieve the prescriptive path. They need to be done performance, which then they require a, a, a seal, which can be done by the SIP manufacturer with their shop drawings. They provide uh, engineered shop drawings. Uh, but as an architect, I'd be able to stamp those submissions, technical submissions. Um, so I could even be a resource for you to help you determine where, you know, based on your location, who the best manufacturer is to, to contact is a, uh, if you have a project in Florida, you don't want SIPs coming from, from Washington State. It just doesn't make sense. Um, uh, lots of resources. So, uh, In summary, uh, hopefully I have given you enough to describe and define SIPs in their applications, explain SIP energy strategies, illustrate SIP design, and list this, and describe some current industry standards and resources. And we will, that's kind of the end of that. So if there's a open discussion, I I have my calendars actually open this afternoon for the most part. So I'm free and willing to talk more, discuss, get into some details. This does conclude the continuing ed portion of that. Um, so what I'm gonna do in the chat box is I'm gonna put the website uh, for you to enter in your information to be able to get those credits and get a certificate if you'd like one. Uh, it's also a place if you want to reach out to me and, and have a more one-on-one -on -one discussion, we can um, do that uh, on a scheduled base, you know, scheduled appointment basis. Thank you, Andy. <clears throat> I do appreciate uh, you coming in and talking with us about the SIPs panels. Absolutely. We have, uh, we have a few questions. Um, you answered my question about <laughs> SIPs roofs, trust systems and stuff, <clears throat> but it actually opened up another question for me. Um, I have a current house that wants to be a one and a half story house. Uh, they're thinking of using a combination of ICF and SIPs. Mm -hmm. uh, if I did the foundation in ICF and the rest of it in SIPs, how would I do a second floor uh, how would I do the floor systems? So do they have to be ledgered in, or is that something where you just put in uh, foam insulation or whatever? No, I would uh, probably what I would do is um, uh, run your SIP all the way up to your roof and then uh, attach a ledger to the face of the SIP and then hang your floor structure from that. So assuming you're, I mean, that's easily can be done. Um, a typical SIP, I don't think we would have to do anything specific or unusual to get that to work. Um, 
I think, you know, if you're doing a one and a half, uh, you know, I think of a Cape Cod, you know, not, not a real big mm-hmm. house. Right. Um, those spans aren't going to be huge spans to where <laughs> the itself will be able to support that. Um, so I would use the detail of continuing up, putting your roof on top and then attaching your ledger on the inside face of that. Okay. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> Heather asked a question. Um, how much time are you spending on SIP shop drawings review to make sure each panel is accurate? So mm-hmm. how, how did they just kind of go through them or is this a, a yeah, um, I don't do a whole lot of review mm-hmm. onto it. Um, you know, they're, it's a delegated design. So they're the ones responsible for providing a shop drawing that um, utilizes their panels to the most efficiency. Um, I normally look at to make sure the windows and doors are in the right place and are the right size. Uh, if they're getting pre-cut in the factory, they, um, yeah, you don't want to have to come and cut. You can cut a panel after it's been delivered. Uh, but if you're cutting it already, you know, making sure your your cuts are right. And what I normally recommend doing is before they fabricate those, is actually send them the window and door order so they have the rough opening sizes, and they'll uh, they'll perci- you know precision cut those right into it. Um, the other things that I look at are if there's any um, making sure the wire wire chases are where they need to be. Um, if you don't give them any direction, they're just going to put a wire chase at 16 inches and one at 44 inches all the way around. And usually on the side of doors, uh, assuming that there's a wall sconce or something on the outside to make it a little bit easier for you to, you know, just kind of use it all as you need. Um, the shop drawing review for me, um, since I'm already optimized on my plans, it's pretty, it's pretty quick for me to, to go through it. Um, Having a designer involved in those discussions makes the the process a lot quicker for the homeowners. A um, lot of the projects before I really got into it, or before any architects were or designers were involved, you know, the manufacturers would work with the homeowners, and there would be like seven or eight back and forth, <laughs> just because they're, you know, they're a manufacturer trying to give them what they want. You know, and a homeowner may not necessarily know what they really need. Um, so for a designer, it's you know one or two reviews. I've I think the most I've spent is a twenty minute review. I don't look at all the structural components of that because they're providing their own structural design calculations and seal for that. So I, I try to just keep it in, making sure that it's coincided with the the design itself, and uh, make any comments as needed for that. Great. Um, <clears throat> Oliver, uh, has asked, oh no, I'm sorry for that one. Chris asks, can you talk about SIPs manufacturers you've worked with and what you've learned working with each? Hmm. Well, I work with, I work <laughs> with all of them. Um, you know, if they're a SIP member, I work with all of them. Um, all of them have their Uh, Pros and cons, benefits, Um, not all the manufacturers are created equally. Um, There's some manufacturers that are set up with, you know, full CNC machines and full automation uh, to be able to fabricate the the panels, you know, pretty quick. Um, Those are the ones that are able to do some really large projects and large number of them at a time. Um, then there's some of the smaller ones that don't have those automated features. So that there are some that are still pressing the panels and then they would bring them out and then they would cut the openings with a, you know, a chainsaw or a circular saw. Um, doesn't make them any worse than anybody else. Um, sometimes they, they take better care you know, and, and they just, they're there enjoying what they want to do. Uh, but there's, you know, there's, they're all good manufacturers. If they're a SIPA member, then I know quality assurance is there because um, the association is kind of overseeing as a third party. Um, they're not really, you know, we're associated, but we're we're there to make sure that we're all doing it right and we're all doing it consistently because um, as an industry, we don't, you know, word gets out when something goes bad. So we're all there to help each other. Um, but if there's any specific locations 
you know, I have my favorites depending on location. Um, but I don't think I'm going to name any names on this on this podcast. Uh, but <laughs> if, if there's any uh, specific ones, uh, we, we can um, have a, a one-to-one talk. You know, Dennis, I'll give you my information to share with everybody. Um, if they you fill out the the Google form, I'll have their email and I'll follow up with every one of them that that puts it on there. And uh, we can get into more okay. in the weeds discussion for that. Great. So Oliver has a uh, issue I'd like to talk to you about. Uh, he has a homeowner that can't do SIPs because they don't think a crane can get into their wooded property. How can you get them into place? Uh, well, wall panels can be manhandled pretty easily. Um, the roof panels, depending on the spans, um, we've done the, the four the four by four sky track lifts and not an actual crane. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, the biggest panel weighs probably, you know, it's four pounds per square foot is what a SIP weighs. So, you know, an eight by 24, I'm not real good on fast math, but uh, using a using a, a sky lift will work pretty well. Um, but those are the eight by 24. So, I mean, how often are, you know, in the woods, you're probably not going to have a big panel like that. Um, but if you have any concerns about getting it up there, <clears throat> We can certainly break those panels into four foot by, you know, whatever length. They don't have to be the eight foot. They can be the four foot. And a four foot is much easier to manhandle with um, just ground track and and things like that. So. Great. That's, yeah, that could be a concern in a lot of areas, uh, oh, smaller lots, stuff like that. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> yes, yeah, so another quite well, actually, um, uh, a gentleman from Northeast Sips has not responded in months by email or phone, and he's got drawings sent to them for estimates. He wants to know if there's another way, another person that he can contact for Northeast Sips. And I'm per- perfect, uh, purposely not saying the name of the person okay. because of being on. So sure. if you want to get a hold of him somehow uh, yeah, and go uh... over that. I'm going to throw in a couple of my other links on here if they're still on here. Yeah, I would definitely want to talk to them and, and connect because um wondering who that is. Um, so there's my email address. Okay. Um, there's, we got a bunch of other links on here, but I think sips.org is where you get most of them. Um, but yeah, I'll, I'd, I'd be happy to talk to them and then, uh, hopefully they don't have your money. I mean, that's yeah. the thing. Um, if it's just a matter of not getting response, you know, it's uh, yeah, everybody's busy too. So yeah, you know, this is the time everyone's getting ready to you know, break ground in the spring when the weather breaks. So, but yeah, for you know, sales reps, that's what they're responsible for is is making those th- connections. So yeah, uh, send me an email. We'll see if we can help you out, or or maybe there's another avenue for you to go all right <clears throat> so chris asks what the typical lead times after shop drawings are i'm assuming after that's shop. what he was talking they yeah so the, the process is usually once they receive a deposit um to proceed on the, the i mean the the quotes are free you know you don't pay for the initial quote so you send them the plans they'll give you basically a, a takeoff they won't give you any drawings uh, but they'll have an idea of kind of how many panels they need because that's what they need to generate the quotes from. Um, but usually within two weeks from signing a uh, purchase order, you'll have um, your first round of shop drawings. And they they typically say two to four weeks from signing the contract to through the, the shop drawing process. So the two weeks is on my projects are about two weeks because I get a a pretty quick approval on it because we've already kind of vetted it all up to begin with. Uh, but, you know, after the first round, it's usually, you know, within a couple of days, you'll have a revision based on any comments. Um, and then once you've, once you've approved the, the shop drawings, the delivery to the site, um, depending on how big the project is, is typically um, four to six weeks, I think right now, but four weeks is kind of the, the typical runtime for most of the manufacturers currently uh, from the time shop drawings are approved. Um. Okay. Um. 
let me uh, I'll, I'll just expand oh. on that too um the nice thing about going that process is you can actually coordinate your schedule um so it could be ready to go in four weeks but if you're not ready for five weeks you know they'll they'll hold off the delivery until you're ready for it they don't want to deliver and have them sit there for a week so they'll they'll work with you and have them sit in their shop you know in their yard before they ship them um, so they they definitely work with you on that great um i have Ming Ting asking if you have any idea of a cost comparison between sips and the traditional stick build uh yeah we do and um sam rashkin has been an advocate for us to to create a an online sips versus stick <clears throat> cost comparison tool and I'll throw that link on the on the chat. Um, the um, a lot of the the issues that we've always run into is with SIPs is builders who don't really understand beyond the initial many the uh, material cost. A lot of times when they get the material cost, they say, "Oh, that's too much. We're not going any farther than that," um, because you know, as a material cost, you're getting. Uh, you're going to pay a little bit of a premium for that. And I say that only because they don't understand or don't even, a lot of times they don't realize what all is they need to replace from their ship, you know, from their typical stick build that is replaced from the SIPs, you know, like the the air sealing and the, the even the insulation. A lot of times they're getting a lumber package, but they're, they're forgetting the entire insulation package of that. Um, and they also a lot of times forget the, uh, the actual labor. Um, you know, my, my parents' house was under roof in about five days with three guys, whereas the same house would have been two weeks with 20 guys. You know, it's um, uh, that cost comparison tool, the SIPA truecost.org <clears throat> is um, a spreadsheet that you can enter in the information on there, and um, it'll give you some components of value that sometimes you don't realize that you get from SIPs that you don't get from from a traditional stick build like the you know the full vaulted volume of the attic space is now conditioned space well that, there's value to that and if you do that maybe you can eliminate the basement because you can put your mechanics in the in the attic as opposed to having to put them down below so it kind of walks you through that kind of thing um Personally, me, and I've known this for a while, it's hard to really convince builders uh, without any hard data, but we know that SIP builds in the long run are much cheaper than a conventional stick build. And um, you may not see it right away, but when you add in the, the reduced uh, mortgage rates in most cases, the incentives available from the IRA and, and zero energy ready programs, um you know all those all that value comes back to you that you may not have realized when you're initially going through the planning of this um yeah that's gonna be i'm i'm, I'm looking forward to going to that and doing some comparisons for my customers because they are very interested in alternative building and something a little greener and so am i so yeah this will be a that's good a Dave says, <clears throat> further to the earlier question, I think it's a question where I was asking you about floor joists and stuff like that. Regarding a two-story SIP design, is there additional structure added at the ledger height? Can't imagine simply fastening to a single layer 716 OSB could have the required strength. Also, the added weight to the lower section of wall ends up carrying changes. Does the sheathing material change in such cases in other words is there any more is there more structural changes that need to happen when you're dealing with that what what kind of what are we dealing with there i guess yeah so the answer is no there's nothing additional that needs to be done um as i explained at the at the beginning uh, a sip has the equivalent bearing capacity of a two by ten at 16 on center which we know houses a uh, two-story houses you know not needing that much of it um, the ledger board, uh, I guess I should explain more of how it's attached. It's not just screwed in surface through the board into the 
into the OSB, it's actually used the SIP screws from the backside that goes through the panel and catches into the, the ledger board from the backside. So those SIP screws and they're spaced at anywhere from six inches on center staggered to 12 inches on center, kind of dependent on the load requirement. So I guess um, the part that would change depending on the loads would be how many of those SIP screws do you need to have your ledger board attached to the SIP. Um, most cases it's 12 inches on center staggered. Um, I've seen it down to eight inches on center <laughs> for, you know, like a 16 foot floor joist span. Um, but other than that, yeah, nothing more is, is needed beyond that. Because with the SIP, you know, it's a whole component. So it's all glued together. It's basically one solid component once it's pressed and delivered on site. All right. I hope that answered the question, Dave. I hope so. It did for me. <laughs> huh. uh, there's an iPhone uh, guest who came on and he is, he says his concern is with moisture and rot. Can you address that? Uh, if I understand what he's getting at, um, yeah, with the SIP, yeah, moisture is usually due to lack of ventilation. <clears throat> uh, with a SIP house, you have to have mechanical ventilation either through an ERV, HRV, or air exchanger. Um, when it comes to putting siding on a house, uh, you'd, you'd want to install it as a rain screen and not have it attached directly to the SIP. Uh, that way you have a back vented rain screen to allow any moisture on the exterior to be able to to drain out um yeah the, the biggest thing is making sure that the panel has an opportunity to to dry out so houses don't you know they say house needs to breathe well no a house doesn't need to breathe but it needs to dry and uh, as long as you have the pieces of you know back venting your facade and your and your roof and having proper ventilation on the inside, then moisture is, is usually never an issue. Uh, so with without the moisture, rot isn't an issue. Um, I'm sure you've probably seen or heard some horror stories of you know rotted SIPs. 99% of SIP failures is due to the pro improper installation and not because of the product itself. And if you actually go back and read when those were posted, those were pre-1992, which is when SIPA was founded. And SIPA was founded to help correct some of the black eyes that the industry had received um, you know, through the past. And it's been because of improper installation. Um, since then, I've we have seen and heard a lot less issues um, Al Cobb, he, one of his big component is um, forensic investigation. Um, Dennis, you're in his neighborhood. You might actually look into to visiting his place. He's uh, as far east in West Virginia as you can and still be in West Virginia. Um, his name is what? Al Cobb? Al Cobb with SIP School. He's in Shepherdstown, West Virginia. <clears throat> um, so very close to Maryland and D.C. and, and whatnot, but um, yeah, he has a lot of horror stories of those, you know, whenever there's a problem, he's the one that's usually called in to, to come and investigate and, and provide um, corrections. And I haven't heard recently as many as what I had when I initially came into the industry. So I think as an industry, we've done a really good job at educating and, and making sure that installs are being done properly. And um you know, avoiding as much as we can. You know, it's a building science, you know, it's the same issue, you know, when we get into new components too, we're going to have similar issues. You know, I honestly see the zip system is going to be, you know, the zip ZIP system is going to be, have its own heartburn, <laughs> you know, once, you know, once those have been around for a certain amount of time. Um, yeah. But we've been, you know, zips have been around since the thirties and the you know, seventies, early seventies. And then the nineties is, you know, we've got a lot of historic data that we've been able to respond and react to. The first, same person says uh, they're concerned about having to be so perfect on installation and every sub doing the right thing. <laughs> I have to say that that should be the concern, even in stick build. Um, yes. There's uh 
there's there's instructions on everything. Um, I, I used to build uh, when I was out framing. You know, you made a mistake, you corrected it. it mm -hmm. That's just the way it works. Um, so the one thing, like yeah, the one thing with the SIP though is you eliminate a lot of those layers of subs. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, you've got one one installer that's doing the equivalent of what four subs would be doing on a project. So by having that one person, and that's where having the blower door test before drywall is really critical. Um, without the air infiltration, you know, if you reduce the air infiltration, you reduce any kind of opportunity for capillary action of of water coming into any of those conditions. Mm -hmm. And you have a little bit more room for error, in my opinion, on a SIP than you do on a stick build. And um, even if it gets in into the assembly, again, as long as you have that drying pathway, even if the moisture gets in there and it has the opportunity to get out, it, it's not going to cause any problems in the long run. So you had mentioned something about a rain screen for putting siding on. Mm -hmm. Um, and that caught that, that, that created a question for me because, because I'm new to SIPs and not have not done anything with them. Does that mean that you would put like a furring strip and then, yeah, yeah. Uh, would you so, put a moisture bar barrier in between? Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah. A lot of, a lot of the manufacturers still say just doing a 30 pound felt as your underlayment on a, on a wall is, is sufficient. Um, you can do a Tyvek. Um, I've found, a, a a product, I think it's Tamlin that makes it, but it's got little dimples that are embedded into their weather barrier. So by putting that on there, then you can attach like your LP smart side directly to that. It provides a th uh, about a three eighths inch gap behind it to allow anything to dry out. I normally don't recommend doing hardy, um, Unless, well, do Hardy if you have a rain screen. I would, I would never do Hardy any other way because it's a, you know, it's a reservoir <laughs> material. It's going to hold water. It just, uh, I only do it in wildfire areas because it's uh, non-combustible. But, uh, but having the proper installation details is really critical when it comes to to using those materials. Yeah. And you have the details on the SIPS site. So uh, the SIP sites have, the... um, I mean, they're they're generic because they're yeah. you know trying to spread out through the entire um, association, which every manufacturer isn't as detailed as as others. But if you go to you know if you find a manufacturer and you go to their website and contact their technical data, they've got specific details specifically that they created for their product, but in my opinion, it would work for any SIP product because, you know, the SIP is really made the same way in every, from every manufacturer. I've got a lot of, you know, details of my own. I'm actually working on probably putting some of those details on AIBD's high performance um, library. So if you're a member of AIBD, you'd, you'd have access to those. Um, but, you know, again, I'm, I'm available to consult on an as needed basis, if there's a specific condition and, you know, let's, let's talk and make sure, sure. you got the right condition there. So. <laughs> Ted, Ted Hake says AIBD. I figured <laughs> some of <laughs> Yeah. Uh, well, you know, so yeah. He owes it. me a beer now at I, I, IBS, you know, I put a plug out for AIBD for. <laughs> there you go. Um, uh, one by the last... way, if anyone's going, by the way, if anyone's going to IBS in Vegas, I will be there the entire week as a SIPA representative. So, uh, yeah. if you do just, uh, you know, if you signed up, you know, through this here and, you know, we'll, I'll send an email and just let me know. I'd love to, to connect with anyone who's there. So I would, I would love to go, but that would require somebody sponsoring my entire trip. <laughs> that's the only way it would happen <laughs> yeah so, i guess if anybody well, on you join, here you join sipa and be on the yeah, yeah if anybody although i'm paying here, my own would... way but that's my yeah, own they... benefit as uh so i was gonna say if anybody on here wants to uh sponsor my my trip there i'm i'm open i can get I, you all I, the free food but... you want there you go <laughs> <laughs> So I have one last question. I believe it's the last question. And if it's not, somebody please let me know. Um, they want to know how much it affects the permit. 
Um, so basically, if you're doing a SIPS, uh, you know, usually you can get stick frame thrown through. Now, I'll, I'll, I'll explain, like in my area where we are very rural um, and sometimes something new is not seen as something good or able to be done. Um, give you an example, uh, uh, barn dominiums around here don't generally get allowed. You're going to end up wanting to do regular stick frame or something similar rather than timber frame. I don't think there's that much of a problem with uh, SIPs panels here or even ICF or any of those um, those alternative building pra uh, practices. However, I know that there are some areas where if the if the permit uh, reviewers don't understand it, it's not going through. Mm -hmm. um, so, and I guess is do you see a lot of that still? Um, I see a little bit of it. Um, even here in Ohio, we have, um, some people who like, I've got one up in just North of Columbus who we submitted, they submitted the plans as a stick build, but decided to do SIPs. So they sent in the SIP man, shop drawings to it. And their comment back was, okay, now update your plans to be SIPs and not stick. So that's, that's really kind of the bigger thing because the way that the, <laughs> The way that the plan reviewers look at it, you know, SIPs is an engineered component, just like a, a trust. You know, a roof trust, you got it's a delegated review for that. Um, since SIPs have been in the IRC since 2012, I think most of them know what they are and at least have an understanding that it is an acceptable component. Um, most of the time, they will accept it with a, a professional seal on it which is why I'm licensed in 32 states. So I can just <laughs> avoid that discussion altogether. And we're, we're already there. And, um, but you know, the manufacturers will provide a, a, you know, a seal on their drawings, uh, but they just have to be coordinated with your in initial submission. So you can still turn in the napkin sketch as long as you don't, do, as long as you have the information there that coincides with what the SIP shop drawings are. So usually they will, you know, I always have on there as a delegated submittal be the SIP shop drawings unless I'm able to coordinate and have it included. Now, if I have it, I will include it with my submittal so that it's all there. Um, but yeah, out in the middle, you know, even out in the most remote areas, a lot of them don't even have plan reviews, period. So, yeah. and when they're doing a, a SIP building, it's their way of assuring that they're getting a product that's been engineered and has a backup of a seal and a manufacturer to it. Right. So, um, I mean, yeah, I, I, I did have, <laughs> I've got a picture that I, yeah, the, I've got one story on this, the project I, I did one in outside Raleigh, North Carolina, and, um, they had never seen SIPs before. And this was back in 2019 or 28, I think in 2018. And I got a picture from the homeowner of the building inspector out in his car his window was open, the drawings were flung out of the side of his car, and he was on the speakerphone with the chief building official, because he went there for an, install, an insulation inspection. And with the SIP, you don't have an insulation inspection because it's all component in there. He had no idea what he was doing, but I thought it was kind of funny seeing them sitting there with the drawings flung out the window, not knowing what he's doing. Um, he he learned real quick, and they, they, we've done a number of SIP projects since then. And most of the time, once they understand and see it, they they're they're all on board. Um, I mean, it's it's a great product. I don't know why more people don't use it. Um, well, I know why more people don't use it, but we do see an increase in in activity at the SIPA level of people calling, wanting to go down that road and. I want to say the pandemic helped a little bit of that. Um, people are stuck in their homes. If they're going to be stuck in a new home, they want to be healthy. And, you know, indoor air quality is greatly improved with this. Um, lower energy bills and all all that kind of stuff just kind of comes together and makes it a really good discussion for them. And they've had time to think about it. And if they're going to do it again, let's do it. Do it that way. And, and yeah, with the ICFs, I've actually um, <laughs> on a 
one of his projects he's wanting to put a sip roof on a church in arizona and um yeah they they go great together it just it does take some thought and planning ahead of time to make sure those connections work yeah well they'll work but make sure they make sense yeah and uh, if it doesn't make sense or if it's complicated then people aren't going to do it but if we keep it as simple as we can then uh it'll it'll really take off in my opinion great um if anybody else has any more questions now's a good chance to quickly say yes otherwise i am going to thank andy because he's taken a lot of time uh where i think we're at an hour and a half right now um and there's robert i knew you showed up <laughs> <laughs> hi robert i guess i need to give you a call out <laughs> or i guess i need to call you um, I'm st i've still got your drawing working yeah. on it so so yeah. so fortunately in this in this session we have in this webinar we have done a shout out to the aibd and to icf um all so that we could let you all know a little bit more about the sips panels and why you should be doing more of those rather than traditional stick building <laughs> <laughs> It's been my pleasure. <laughs> I have really enjoyed it. And thanks for being, uh, I guess, my guinea pig on my first presentation. Hopefully I okay. uh, covered uh, what it was that you hope that I cover. And um, You did a great job presenting it and bringing stuff up. Um, and uh, you did a great job with presenting it, actually. Uh, I wouldn't be afraid to uh, take this on the road, honestly, if I was you. You did a really good job. Um, I think you helped us understand the benefits of SIPs over uh, especially traditional uh, framing and, yeah. and construction. Um, well, there's a lot more I could talk about, but uh, it would be an all day thing. And yeah, like I said, I mean, uh, open discussion is always a good, good opportunity for that. And, yeah, we can always do other webinars, you know, we can, we yeah. can spread them way out. So <laughs> well, I will, I will add on top of this, uh, you know, I am on the whole, the high performance team on AIBD and we do, uh, our monthly podcast for high performance on I think it's the third Tuesday of every month. And um, we haven't gotten into the SIP discussion yet, but uh, that's definitely coming in there as well. And I'm uh, Sam Rashkin has agreed to come on as a guest to that show and, and talk about his um, housing 2.0, how SIPs can really benefit that and, and really the direction that we should be going as a, a housing industry. And, I really look forward to that discussion. And um, have you had conversations with Mike Maines? I have not uh, directly, just indirectly through uh, the Facebook groups. But uh -huh. uh, I know he's uh, the beer and uh, the BS and beer podcast. Yeah. He's got the uh, one of the co-authors of uh, his book was uh, the Pretty Good House. Pretty Good House. Yeah, yeah I know uh, he has uh, some. Uh, I don't want to say issues with SIPs. I know SIPs is in, oh. in is uh, you know components, <laughs> which is fine, and um, I'm I'm happy to have that discussion more with them. And um, yeah, now that we have, you know, the carbon has always been the discussion on some of those, and we do have the EPDs now available for that, and it's not nearly as bad as people want to say it right. is. And um, there's just you know, with the low energy costs over a 50 year period and, you know, the, you've got your, your um, operation carbon and your production carbon or whatever. It's, uh, you know, once you balance that all out, it, it's, it looks pretty good, you know, compared to some other components. So, yeah. So that's, that's what we're trying to do is just educate and answer the questions as we gain the information. When the information's there, we're, we're ready to share that for everybody. So. That's awesome. Well, I'm going to go ahead and get ready to close this out. Uh, let you get going back to your your work in your office. I know you're probably busy. Um, I have a lot of information that I will be putting on when I send this up to the YouTube web YouTube section on the description. I'm going to put a lot of this uh, information up there. Uh, go ahead and message me if there's anything you don't want me to put up there or if you have other stuff you want me to put up on that. Uh, so people can go ahead and uh, continue their their education with the SIPs and, and get more resources and information. Um, but other than that, if there's nothing else, 
I don't see anybody. Everybody's just saying thanks. Um, <laughs> That's been my pleasure. And uh, yeah, if you have any questions or want any more information, you know how to, to reach out to me. And uh, yeah, I'll uh, keep up on these and maybe come on the future ones. So sounds great. Yeah, All I look right. forward to uh, to talking with you more about this because I have some information I need to get from you. <laughs> <laughs> Bring it on. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Okay. Uh, Thank you very much. And everybody, You're you welcome. have a, a wonderful day. And I hope you enjoyed. Bye. Bye.